very dramatic emphasis. <laughs> I thought, uh, Here we go. yeah. So then I thought, though, I didn't put that in the Prezi. That, that sound, I thought, where, where the heck is that coming from? <clears throat> okay, so I have 60 minutes, this first part, and, and uh, after last night, what I decided to do, we're going to spend about the first 20 to 25 minutes, I'm going to give you some strategies for introducing uh, philosophical thinking to your students, and then the second uh, 35 minutes or so, we're going to focus specifically on reading complex texts, and we're going to look at John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and I have a couple of strategies for introducing those texts to them and then making some connections. And I know I'm going to run out of time because I'm playing way more than 60 minutes will allow. So whether or not we move some of that into the next session, I, we'll have to figure out. I'll figure out, that out over lunch. So like I talked about last night, getting students to think philosophically. Um, what I do, and, and just for those of you that are maybe a little bit apprehensive about this, you might say, well, you're teaching college kids and that is a huge difference. And what I would say is that in the fall of 2010, I went from teaching 18-year-old seniors in high school to 18-year-old freshmen in college. And if you think there is a monumental shift in uh, maturity and developmental capability between May and August of your 18th year, the answer is no. That, that, is, that is not the case. All right? <laughs> yeah, right. And so uh, when I... When I when I'm teaching, whether it's my Foundations of Education class or I teach a, a class to freshmen called The Self or Own and Others where we read philosophical texts that wrestle with what it means to know yourself or is there a self. We read Descartes, we read Whitman, we read Carl Jung, we read Martin Buber, we read William James. And when I'm introducing 18-year-olds to those texts, it's intense. We read Rene Descartes' Meditations in the first week of their freshman year. And I don't just throw it to them and say, uh, what does Descartes mean when he says, I think, therefore I am. I use some of the same strategies that I'm going to encourage you to use. I take those complex, te te complex texts, I break them down into small chunks. I rewrite them sometimes and give them the rewritten versions so they can see how this is worded in today's vernacular, and then we go back to the original text. And so I, I hope that you can use this in your own classrooms. The second thing that I would say, Stephanie and I were talking about this. There's a piece that I'm going to give Stephanie to upload to the Unit 1 folder and it's an article by a scholar who advocates teaching philosophy to children. And what she does is she has conversations that she has had with 9 and 10-year-olds and with 12 and 13-year-olds where they're having philosophical conversations that we don't identify as philosophical conversations. And we quite often don't validate our students' thinking. I was telling somebody last night that my 9-year-old, who's not uh, working on quantum physics or anything like that, she's a typical 9-year-old. We were in Fort Myers, Florida where my in-laws are retiring. And she asked me the question, she said, Dad, how many grains of sand do you think are on this beach? And that's not a, I mean, she's not going to be writing her dissertation in the next few weeks. But nonetheless, that question is a question that ponders the nature of the universe, the scope and size of the world that we live in. And that is a deep and profound question, even though it's coming from a nine-year-old. And what I would encourage you to do is to validate those questions when our students ask them and to encourage them to have those kinds of conversations. And we don't need to come to this from a position of having all the answers. Because A, our job may not be to give the answers, and B, we may not have the answers. And if we pr pretend to have them, then we lose credibility with our students because we are those people who are like every other adult who pretends to know when we actually don't. So what I do, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with sticky notes. First thing that I do, is I give everybody a sticky note, my students. And, and there's a great video uh, on the website, and, I'll, and maybe I'll send that to Stephanie too, it's on Edutopia, edutopia.org. They have a video of a teacher who uses sticky notes as a data collection tool. And I don't know if you use sticky notes. If you don't, you should use sticky notes. You should buy stock in sticky notes for 3M, I guess. And what I do is I, my anticipatory set is this question. Finish this sentence, then what is philosophy? Everybody in the class writes what is philosophy on the sticky note. I collect them. I haven't put their names on them. And then I read them out loud, but I don't read their names. And so everybody hears what everybody else has to say about what philosophy is. And although their names are on them, I don't read their names because I don't believe, I, I don't want to embarrass anybody or anything like that. But as I'm reading them to the class out loud, I'm making three piles of sticky notes. Get it, don't get it, get it better than I thought they would. And what I can do in the next part of the activity, which we're going to read some complex text, is I can 
make flexible grouping arrangements where I can put all the students who didn't get it in one group and I could give them a particular reading that has been modified in a way that is more at, the le at their level of readiness. Or I can group the students uh, heterogeneously and I could have one, two, three, one, two, three, and each group is comprised of a student who didn't get philosophy, who got it, and who got it better than I thought they would. So this is a great way to collect data and I use them all the time in my classes. And in my grade book, I have a page for every one of my students, and I take the sticky notes, and I stick them on the page, and then after three or four days, I go back, and I go through the sticky notes, and I assess the standard or the objective that I was looking at, and I evaluate the student, I, throw the sti I recycle the sticky notes, and we start over. You guys use sticky notes? So I probably didn't have to do all that, did I? This is the finding balance between people that do this for a living and teaching people that don't. Okay, here's, a, here's about a minute and 34 second Explanation of philosophy. Chad. Apparently I cut that out. Do we need to watch it? The last gentleman is strong. In philosophy what we do is we like to take ideas and ask basic questions. Uh, what is it? What does it mean? How does it work? What's it hold? Philosophy studies the most fundamental ideas in our conceptual scheme and how they apply to things in the world. That's your typical philosophy right there. I see it is the uh, use of reason and argumentation to address questions like, does God exist? Can you ever really know anything? Are we free or is somehow everything determined? What will happen to me when my body dies? What's the difference between right and wrong? Those kind of questions that we don't really have answers for in science, we just sort of have to think about them. And we use thought experiments, sort of hypothetical scenarios to sort of figure out what we believe about things. And in the end, what we try to do is develop a, what we call a worldview, which is sort of all the beliefs that you have. And what we want is to have the most reasonable possible set of all beliefs. And so we investigate our beliefs, we think about arguments, we might um, compare our beliefs with others, and we might give reasons and counter arguments for why we hold the beliefs that we have. And at the end of that project, we hope to have a really solid, coherent set of views about the world that are reasonable and complete and that we can feel comfortable with, that we sort of know where we fit in the world and how we think about all those things. This is what my students typically think philosophy means when I get them that first semester. I'm going to zoom in on each one of them. I get this a lot. I actually, when I interviewed at Grandview, I didn't, I didn't know the campus very well, and I was not lost, but I didn't know where I was going. And so I see a guy who's got a sweater with holes in it, his hair is all over the place, and I literally thought um, that he probably shouldn't be here. And uh, I made an assumption. And he said, are you lost? And I said, yeah, I'm looking for Rasmussen, whatever, whatever. He said, it's up to here. He pointed to where I had to go. So I went to the room, and I get into the room. About five minutes later, this guy comes in and sits down, and he is a sociology professor. His name is Jim White. I don't know if anybody has ties with Grandview. But uh, I thought, OK, this is going to be interesting. Most brilliant human being I've ever met in my life. Learned more probably about thinking and about thinking about thinking from Jim White in the last six years than probably anybody else. And I made a false assumption. He looked like a philosophy professor. <laughs> in, case, in case you were wondering. <clears throat> and then I don't know why this one made me laugh. If you've seen that 70s show. Oh, so if my, my son who's a freshman in college, if he comes to me and he says, Dad, I'm going to major in philosophy, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, great. There's that philosophy factory that just opened that you can get a job in. <laughs> Instead, like I said yesterday, I'm encouraging them to, to wrestle with this question, what does it mean to be in the world? And as civics teachers, obviously, as a reminder of last night, this is a question that's incredibly important to us as we're concerned about current and future global citizens. I'm a firm believer, if you've read Socrates' Apology, the idea on line 38A of the Apology, Socrates says that the unexamined life is not worth living. And in my Foundations of Education classes, we read the Apology and Crito, and I challenge my students to wrestle with those questions. What does it mean to be educated? What is an educated person's responsibility in society? What does it mean to live consistently? And this is something that if you've read or if you're familiar with Socrates' trial and death, 
in his trial, he is, he is accused of corrupting the minds of the youth and believing in false gods. And instead of doing what most Greeks do when they are accused of crimes, which is why it's called the apology, they get up and say they're sorry, and they wail, and they bring their family, and then they hope that the jury has sympathy. And of course, Socrates doesn't do that. He gets up, and he addresses each one of his accusers, and he systematically disproves the claims against him using the Socratic method and using inductive reasoning. And that's not what the Senate wants, to, or the jury wants to hear. They want to hear him apologize. And when he doesn't apologize, he's found guilty. So when he's found guilty, he's, uh, he is, his, his uh, punishment is banishment. And so Socrates is in jail. One of his students comes to him. His name's Crito. And Crito says, Socrates, I got a plan. We can get you out of here. We can get you to Thebes. There are people in Thebes who will take care of you. And Socrates says, okay. This is what we'll do. Crito, if you can make an argument for why I should leave, and why it makes sense for me to leave, then I'll do it. So Crito starts to make the argument. And Socrates then disproves Crito's argument one by one. And what Socrates argues is that he has lived in this city his whole life. Every one of the Socratic dialogues, if you've read them, are in the city of Athens. He only leaves Athens one time, and it's in the Phaedrus. And it's an interesting story, but I, but I won't get into that. He says that because I have lived here, I've benefited from this society. I have reaped those benefits. I have had every opportunity to leave, and I never left. If I leave now... I will be not living consistently. I will be going against everything that I believe in. I'll be saying, essentially, that I agree to not philosophize. Now, later on, maybe in a different unit, we'll talk about civil disobedience, and we'll kind of juxtapose Socrates and the Crito to Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. But one of the things that Socrates was committed to was living consistently. And that's something that I don't see in most of the people that I interact with. It's something that I certainly don't see in my students is having a set of beliefs and living according to those beliefs. And so we're encouraging our students to live consistently. This is a quote from Cornel West. And I know this is a no-no, but I'm going to read it. A philosopher is a lover of wisdom. It takes tremendous discipline, tremendous courage, I think, for yourself to examine yourself. The Socratic imperative of examining yourself requires courage. It takes more courage to examine the dark corners of your own soul than it does for a soldier to fight on the battlefield. Courage to think critically. Courage is the enabling virtue for any philosopher. I'm not sure, I don't know if you're familiar with Paul Tillich. He's a theologian and a philosopher who wrote a book called The Courage to Be. And Paul Tillich says that we are confronted with one certainty, and that is that we are all going to die. And the question is, how do you live in the face of death? How do you live knowing that you are going to die. That's where the courage comes from. And this is the, the challenge that I'm, the gauntlet that I'm laying down with my students is to examine your lives, to have the courage to do so, and to do so in a systematic way. So one of the ways that I do it we start with truth. This is what I tell students. I tell, or I, this is what I ask my students. I said, does anybody here a vegetarian? Is anybody a vegetarian, by, by the way? Any vegetarians in here? Only carnivores? Mm -hmm. Do you know anybody who's a vegetarian? Mm -hmm. Do you know anybody who's, let's go, let's go to a, a step deeper. Vegans, mm -hmm. anyone? Yeah. I, I had a student in class who was what I would call an aggressive vegan. Not only a vegan, but, but would aggressively come after people that, Eat, that ate meat. <clears throat> so, <laughs> meat eaters, yeah. We, we have, I have, a, I have a, like a buffet last day of my methods class. Everybody brings food, and we just kind of, kind of celebrate the end of a tough semester. And, I, and it was awkward. <laughs> we, we made sure that we had vegan options, but that was, it was not only that, she was going to use this as an opportunity to tell everybody, you know, um, you know what red meat's going to do to you. But it, so anyhow. So I ask my students, if you know somebody who's a vegetarian or a vegan, that is a philosophical position that they're taking in the world. If you know somebody who chooses to not drive a car to work every day and take the bus instead because they're trying to minimize their ecological footprint, that's a philosophical position. My 12-year-old, who in her seventh grade science unit is talking about global climate change and our impact in recycling, and she has dance four nights a week in Johnson, and we live in Beaverdale. And on the way to Johnson, she says, Dad, is there a way we can not drive so much so we don't burn so much fuel? And I'm like, hmm, good question. My son, his wife, he's got that. Yeah. So, yeah it, is it is possible. 
Okay, so now I feel guilty, so <clears throat> Monday night, Gracie will be on the back of my 12-speed, and we'll ride to Johnston. Um, when I was uh, a graduate student, I had a, a professor who was a student of Richard McKeon, who was a philosopher at the University of Chicago. And McKeon said that it is, it, he was, he was uh, disgusted by the fact that we can't talk to each other, especially academics. Fifteen years ago, the chemists and the biologists couldn't talk to each other, and now we have biochemistry departments. But 15 years ago, there was a distinct difference between chemistry is what I do and biology is what I do, and there's no merging of those two. And what McKeon said is that part of the reason that we struggle to talk to each other is because we're coming from such different places. And, and he used a complicated word, epistemology. He says we come from different epistemolo epistemological places. In other words, where does knowledge come from? The biologist and the educator and the philosopher all have different ideas about where knowledge comes from. And so what McKeon decided to do was to create a way to communicate with anybody, regardless of where they come from. And so he tried to categorize thinking into four modes of thought. Idealism, realism, existentialism, pragmatism. And I'm not going to go through all of that, but real briefly, if we're going to wrestle with one question, I wrestled with one question at the very beginning with students, and that's the question of truth. What is truth? What does that word mean? And idealists and realists who believe that there are universal truths that exist outside of us, that we must rely on reason in order to come to understand them, they believe in capital T truth, truth that exists all the time. On the top of a mountain, at the bottom of the sea, the truth is the truth. God exists, for example. Whether you believe God exists or not, God exists. That is the objective universal truth. Or the law of gravity exists. You can say gravity doesn't exist. You can say that gra gravity is a figment of my imagination, but I'll drop my pencil and hit the floor and I'll prove to you gravity ex exists. At the other end of the spectrum, as we get the existentialism, as you probably know, truth is not capital T. It is not universal. Truth is what I make that truth to be. And so we start with this question of truth. And I'm going to show you a, another two-minute video of Stephen Colbert, because when I have the chance, why not? And I don't want to offend anybody if, if, you, uh, if you think with your gut. But here's an example of what that might look like. Tell like it is, I call them like I see them. I will speak to you in plain, simple English. And that brings us to tonight's word. Truthiness. Now I'm saying some of the word police, the uh, word anistas over at Webster. I'm going to say, hey, that's not a word. Well, anybody who knows me knows that I'm no fan of dictionaries or reference books. They're elitist. Constantly telling us what is or isn't true or what did or didn't happen. Who's Britannica to tell me the Panama Canal was finished in 1914? If I want to say it happened in 1941, that's my right. I don't trust books. They're all fact, no heart. <laughs> and that's exactly what's pulling our country apart today. Because face it, folks, we are a divided nation. Not between Democrats and Republicans, or conservatives and liberals, or tops and bottoms, no. <laughs> We are divided between those who think with their head and those who know with their heart. Consider Harriet Myers. If you think about Harriet Myers, of course her nomination's absurd. But the president didn't say he thought about his selection. He said this. I know her heart. Notice how he said nothing about her brain. He didn't have to. He feels the truth about Harriet Myers. And what about a rock? If you think about it, maybe there are a few missing pieces to the rationale for war, but doesn't taking Saddam out feel like the right thing? Right here? Right here in the gut? Because that's where the truth comes from, ladies and gentlemen. The gut. Do you know you have more nerve endings in your stomach than in your head? Look it up. Now, somebody's going to say, I did look that up, and it's wrong. <laughs> well, mister, that's because you looked it up in a book. <laughs> Next time, try looking it up in your gut. <laughs> I did. And my gut tells me that's how our nervous system works. Now, I know some of you may not trust your gut yet. But with my help, you will. The 
truthiness is, anyone can read the news to you. I promise to feel the news at you. Now what I'm showing you, <clears throat> hopefully it's obvious, I don't do all this in 25 minutes. We have, we have time to have these kinds of conversations and we wrestle with this question of where does the truth come from and what is truth. And I think it gives us insight into our current political situation. If you look at conservatives and liberals and whether they be fiscal conservatives or whether they be social conservatives and when we talk about fundamentalist conservatives or religious conservatives who argue that truth comes from somewhere and therefore these guiding principles should lead to the decisions that we make this question is a relevant one. So I like to give my students a hard time. I have a, I have a, a psychology professor friend of mine who says, Chad, you should listen to your gut. He says, your gut never lies to you. Your gut tells you when you're hungry, and it tells you when you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> like, okay, guy, good point. Uh, but thinking with your gut, people say that all the time. My students say, you know, my gut tells me this. And I kind of mock it because I have a tendency to err on the side of reason and ration. However, that at times can minimize the significance of emotion and it can minimize the significance of the way that we do feel. And it makes me think of, if you read Paulo Coelho's The Alchemist, it's about a 150 page book, it's an, it's an amazing book. And in The Alchemist, it's a book about a shepherd, a young shepherd boy who is searching for his treasure and in the book, it's, um, Coelho says, intuition is really a sudden immersion of the soul into the universal current of life where the histories of all people are connected and we are able to know everything because it's all written there. In The Alchemist, Santiago, when he feels something, when he has that intuition, in the book, it is him immersing himself in the soul of the universe. And it's, it's intense, man. I mean, it is, it is an intense thought. So when, I, when Stephen Colbert talks about truth in this and thinking with your gut, and I kind of say, yeah, well, well whatever. There are people who believe that that intuition is a truth of some kind speaking to them. And so I have students wrestle with that thought. I play Pharrell Williams' Happy. If you've listened to the song, I would play it for you right now, but I think better of you because I don't want for the next four hours for you to be thinking of that song in your head, although right now some of you already are, and I apologize for that. <laughs> but if you listen to the lyrics of the song, he says, clap along if you feel like a room without a roof because I'm happy. Clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth. What I tell my students, what you can tell your students, is that philosophy is everywhere. And I use the matrix as a metaphor. And I use the matrix as a metaphor because if you've seen the matrix, how many people have seen the matrix? Okay. You can watch the matrix and it's this action movie with a lot of CG a lot of computer generated images and it's pretty wow and it's, and it's violent and all that kind of stuff. And then you watch the Matrix again for some of the subtle, complex, theological and philosophical underpinnings. There's actually a book out there called Philosophy and the, of the Matrix. But the idea here is that someone who believes what they see is what is real, when in fact it isn't real at all. It's, an, it's kind of a play on Plato's Allegory of the Cave, if you're familiar with the Allegory of the Cave where the slave is in the cave and the slaves are all facing the wall and there's a fire behind them and somebody holding up images that make a shadow on the wall. You guys are familiar with the story? Okay. One of the slaves gets out, breaks away, sees that a horse is really this animal that's this big and you can touch it and ride it and feel it and his mind is blown and he goes back to the cave to tell his friends who only think that a horse is this object, this image that they see on the wall and they tear him to shreds because they can't come to grips with how threatening this idea is. This is a, a different song that I play. It's called The Voice of Truth, but The Voice of Truth tells me a different story. The vo Voice of Truth says, don't be afraid. The Voice of Truth says, this is for my glory. Out of all the voices calling out to me, I will choose and listen and believe to the Voice of Truth. Some people believe that truth comes from a particular higher power. Johnny Cash. You should listen to this song. What is truth? In this particular verse, a little boy of three sitting on the floor looks up and daddy says, Daddy, what is war? And so each of the verses of this Johnny Cash song is a different scenario from the late 60s about the war in Vietnam, about protests, about people that have long hair. And each one of the verses comes back to this question of what is truth. 
And then finally, now if we go back to where I started, the idea that truth exists outside of us, it's universal, it's always the truth, moving across the spectrum to truth is what we make of it. I use John Lennon's song, Imagine, to help students wrestle with this idea that maybe there is no heaven, maybe there's no hell, and maybe the truth is our own truth. Maybe you just can't handle the truth. There was a time when I would show this when it was a lot more effective. We were talking about that last night. I, I thought you guys would appreciate this because most of you are about as old as me or not that far from it. What I'm going to do next, I'm going to show you an object. There's something in the picture, but the quality of the photograph is poor. So I'm going to change the slide. An image is going to show up, and some of you are going to see it right away. And what I'm going to ask you to do is if you see the image right away, don't say anything. Just by a show of hands, how many people think they can see an image in this picture? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What if I told you that it's an animal? Any additional hands? Okay. What if I told you it was a farm animal? A cow? I won't ask people who don't see the cow to raise their hand because that would be embarrassing. Maybe if I zoom out a little bit. So here's an ear and an ear, an eye and an eye and the nose. It's like this is the cow's body. Maybe the cow is turned and looking. Well, let me tell you what that means. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No. No, this is... Um, are, you, are you familiar with Rick Lavoie? Rick Lavoie is a, an expert, is, is a special education expert, and he does a workshop with teachers where he puts this in front of them, and he models what he sees teachers do with students who struggle to get concepts. And he says, he stands over the teacher. You can, you can find this video. It's called um, Something City. Rick Lavoie, something city. It'll come to me. And he says, look harder. Look harder. No, you're not looking hard enough. You need to look harder. And he says, I don't know for sure what that means. What does looking harder mean? Does that mean that I flex all my muscles and squeeze myself when I'm looking at it? And he says, how insane is that? Now, I've got one more for you. Have you all seen this one before? Perhaps? I'm going to change the image. A mother and her child. Does everybody see that? Okay, so this exercise mimics this philosophical concept of objective truth. There's a universal truth. In this case, the cow exists. Not everyone knows or can see the truth. But nonetheless, it's true. So I used that video, I, I, I used that picture of the cow in my interview when I was interviewing for the job at Grandview. And I was uh, doing a unit on cooperative learning and I, and I was talking about seeing things from different perspectives. And when, so if you've ever done this before, it's the most intimidating thing in the world. So the students are in the class and then there's about nine people in the back of the room, the provost, the search committee, the chair of the department. And I do this and I'm thinking I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of myself. And afterwards, one of the people in the search committee who's going to decide whether or not I get this job, she says, there's something else in that picture. And she said, I saw a woman's face in that picture. And I didn't know what to say. No, sorry. There's no... <laughs> Good try. There's no woman's face in that picture. That is actually a picture of a cow that has been, you know... But it made me think that... I don't know if it made me think that maybe there is a skull in the picture or not, but it made, me, it made me think how could I use that in a different way because students may see the truth differently. 
So we're kind of taking this conversation about what is the truth. This is a philosophical idea, something that we probably wrestle with every single day. I'm using it as a springboard to introduce my students to complex thinking. I'm using it as a springboard to introduce them to thinking like a philosopher. Now I'm going to give you, I'm, I'm going to give this, not right this minute, but I'm going to give this to you. It's called the Philosophical Health Check. And it's from this book right here, Do You Think What You Think You Think? It has 30 statements, and you agree or disagree with each of the statements. I'll give it to you later. If, 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 we were, if I had my, the 30 minutes from last night, we'd be doing this right now together. Uh, you, do, you say agree or disagree on all of them. And then what's so cool about this, it's a little bit complicated, but I think I've explained it in the instructions fairly well. Of the 30 statements, there are two contradictory statements about the same theme. So for example, one of the themes is, is morality relative? Can you put a price on human life? Another one is, is there an all good, all powerful God? Another one is, are there any absolute truths? One statement supports the absolute truths, one statement opposes them, and they're scattered throughout the 30 questions. You answer all 30, then you go back and you see how many contradictions there are in your thinking. And so if in one statement you answer agree with the statement that says there is no, that's phrased in a way that says there's no objective truth, and in another question you answer agree with something that says that there is an objective truth, that's a contradiction in your thinking. And what I like to use this with students, the reason I like to use that with students is because it gets them thinking about how consistent their thinking is. And the goal might not, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not getting emotional. <clears throat> the goal, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cry. The goal isn't necessarily that your thinking is never inconsistent because sometimes there are nuances and sometimes there are complexities that require us to have more than just a sentence on a page. But I, then I take that back to that Socratic imperative, living and examine life, living consistently, and what does that mean? Look at Socrates. Socrates lived so consistently that he took poison and committed suicide as opposed to leaving Athens. Now, is that really the standard for consistent living? I don't know. I asked my students that one time, and I had a student raise her hand, and she said, have you read, have you read Cassie Bernal's book? She said, yes. Anybody read this book? Cassie Bernal was a student at Columbine High School. She was a troubled 16-year-old. Her parents sent her to a camp the summer before her junior year to get her crap together. It was a camp that had a overt theological message. She became very um, devout in her beliefs. And uh, when Dylan Klebold was going through the library and shooting kids, he was heard asking kids if they believed in God. And he asked her, and she said yes, and he shot her. And, I mean, that's pretty intense. They have a recording of that. Yeah, I don't know if I could do that. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know if I could hear that. It's pretty, pretty intense. Let me see where I put my little thing in the game. Yes, sir. Like students always ask, why didn't Jewish people just um, say they weren't Jewish? People? Right. And, Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. This is, I mean, it's, it, Socrates is an extremist. And, and we have extremists in our society, too. And that's another conversation to have. Um, I'm reminded of Aristotle. <laughs> that's so stupid. Uh, somebody says that. Anybody who says I'm reminded of Aristotle, <laughs> they think they're... No, but in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, he says we should habituate our soul to virtuous living by avoiding the extremes of excess and deficiency and finding a golden mean. Aristotle advocated 
finding a mean, finding a balance. Now, he said there are some things for which there is no balance. Adultery. Uh, not too much, not too little, just right enough adultery. No. <laughs> no, not at all. So some things there is no middle. But you've got Socrates, the extremist, on the one hand. You've got Aristotle on the other hand who's saying we need to find balance. There must be a balance. And that's what I encourage my students to wrestle with that. You know, how do we find balance between too much and too little? And where is that line? I keep coming back. For some reason, I might keep coming back to these guys in Oregon. And, I, and I'm thinking about extremism. I'm thinking about finding balance. And I'm thinking about what, what point in time do you draw a line in the sand and say no more compromise or no, no more? I, and I don't know what that is in that case. But... Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So we do that in teaching. And, you know, basically, you know, like, at least maybe it's just because of where I work. And it defines how I work with it. But you know, we kind of face that almost daily. Is, is this a battle I'm willing to take on? Or is this, you know, is this a hill I'm willing to die on? Or can I just, you know, it's just a power struggle between the students and staff. Yeah. Yeah, I had a student teacher, my, the very first student teacher I ever had. And uh, he did not get the concept of the fact, and, and I know some of you are over the war metaphor, and maybe it's not appropriate, but um, I, I won't drag it out too long. But the idea that he had to win every battle. And so he had a sixth grade classroom, certain middle school in Des Moines. It was, it was, it was challenging. Sixth graders, you wouldn't think sixth graders would be tough. Sixth grade classroom. And um, young, lady, young lady sits in the front, and you know who the student teacher is. Yeah. Uh, sixth grade, young lady in the front row chews gum. His policy is you don't chew gum. Every time she chewed gum, he hammered her. And he hammered her to the point where she hated him, and she made it obvious, and she chewed gum specifically to piss him off. And every time she had gum in her mouth, he had to stop his teaching and he had to address it. And I told him, I said, okay, you don't have to fight every battle. You've made your point. We can address this at another time. It doesn't have to be addressed right then and right there. And he felt that it was, he was compromising his principles. If she had gum in her mouth and he told her not to have gum in her mouth, right now you're going to take the gum out of your mouth. And it was destroying the classroom culture. Because instead of after class or before class or whatever intervention needed to happen, he needed to deal with it at that moment in time. And things stumbled, or excuse me, things tumbled out of control from there. Other students started getting in on the action. It was like a free, uh, we've all been in a feeding frenzy. There's blood in the water. <laughs> Get out of the water. Uh, and it, it did not end well. It didn't end well. Is that why they're not paying attention to the Yeah, possibly. Yeah, I've heard that well, a tactic was in Waco not to invade. Mm-hmm. They, they just put back and kind of contain themselves. Okay, well, there you guys are. Well, maybe you just. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's and at some some other unit later on. I, I would like to dig into this more. How you all address teaching controversial issues. I 
Back in 2003, I was teaching a unit on the Civil Rights Movement, and we were talking about nonviolent demonstrations, and we were talking about sit-ins, and I asked my students, I said, is there anything that you're committed enough to that you would, that you would engage in civil disobedience? And we had a conversation, and I was like, man, we're really making a difference. Three days later, the front page of the Des Moines Metro section, students were arrested at Senator Chuck Grassley's office for refusing to leave after hours. Mm -hmm. And 10 of those students were my students, and about five more were from Roosevelt. And the principal called me into the office, and you, guys, you all know this, when the principal calls you into the office, whether you're a 16-year-old or 40-year-old, it doesn't feel good. And so the principal calls me into the office, and he says, I heard that you were teaching your students about civil disobedience and sitting in and so on and so forth. And you, did you tell them to do this? And I said, absolutely not. I didn't tell them to do this. I didn't encourage it. I mean, I, I, have, a, I have an ethical problem with teachers who tell their, I mean, I said, no, this is what was happening. And that's, that's a danger. You teach your students to think critically, like we said last night, and you challenge them to stand up for what they believe in, and then they might do it. And there's a little bit of me who was, you know, yeah. <laughs> but then the other part of me was thinking, holy crap. Uh, Senator Grassley refused to see him. And when 5 o'clock or whatever rolled around and they said, you need to leave, and they said, we're not going to leave, then they arrested him. But a week later, Grassley called Dowling. And they had a conference call in the principal's office, and he talked to the students, and he listened to them, and they were they were upset about his vote in favor of invading Iraq. So I have a lot of, I mean, I, I give Grassley a lot of credit, and I respect him. I mean, he called them and he talked to him, and I don't know why. What the, I don't know if he should have talked to him at that moment in time. I don't know how that works, but anyway, it's a danger. So this is that book, Do You Think What You Think You Think? This is a, a, a book that, that I also use. It's called uh, Introducing Philosophy Through Pop Culture. And this is from the Wiley Blackwell series. It has a chapter on South Park, although that might be difficult. Um, uh, Batman. If you could think of the pop culture, then they introduce... Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite books in this series is Bob Dylan and Philosophy. I'm a, kind of a Bob Dylan... Lover, and there is a chapter looking at some of Bob Dylan's music and comparing it to social contract theorists like Hobbes and Locke, and it's fascinating. Okay, we've got 15 minutes. We're going to transition. I have 15 minutes. It's 11:30. I thought it was 11:45. Did they, they? Everybody here knows what time it is. Okay, so this first unit, what are the philosophical and historical foundations of the American political system? And these are some of those questions from unit one. Am I short? Any? This is one way that I like to approach reading complex texts with my students. I'll have a pre-reading activity, a during-reading activity, and then an after-reading activity for the complex text. And the pre-reading activity, there, there are a bunch of different ways you can approach this. The way that I'm approaching this particular reading, and the reading is on the back side. This is an excerpt from Leviathan, which, good grief, that's one of those books you don't want to sit down and try to read cover to cover, uh, at least not if you enjoy life. Um, <laughs> you know, it's about a 1,000 pages. And so I've, I've, I've excerpted Leviathan in some passages from chapter 13, which is really when, when Hobbes talks about human beings being nasty, brutish, and short at their base. And this is what I do for students. A couple different ways to do this. One, on the back side, you can see it's, it's kind of faint, but I've highlighted all the words I think my students are going to struggle with. And for your students, you, you're going to have to make a decision as to what. There's some other words in there that, I'll, that I didn't include, like there too, and that are basically old English words that are based on words that we use today, and so I didn't include them. So I take those words, I highlight them on the other side, I make this matching exercise. Now, a couple things. You can differentiate this for readiness a couple of ways. One, this is a lot. There's 28 words. 
and this is going to be difficult to wrestle with for some students. What I'll do is I'll break it down into 10 or 5 word groups, and then they're just matching within those five words. This is the, again, this is an anticipatory set. It's a pre-reading activity. They haven't read the text yet. They're just going through the definitions. What I did for you all, because I'm a nice person, is that actually the answers go in reverse order. So principally is letter BB, and conservation is letter AA at the bottom. OK. Yeah. Another thing that I like to do with a pre-reading activity like this is I, I will, if, if I don't have as many words, I'll cut them up into slips of paper, of, into slips of paper and I'll have the word and the definition separated and I'll give them an envelope with a pile of papers in them and then they have to physically, manually move the words around. And for some students, if you're, if you're differentiating for, for learning preference, kids who like to use the manual, physical, dexterous kind of manipulations to move the words around. And then I'll, what I'll do is I'll play a game. And I'll say, let me know when you're done. And I'll come around and I'll say, you've got 7 out of 10 right. Or I'll come around and I'll say, you've got 2 out of 10 right. Then they have to think about which ones may or may not be right. But again, this is just a pre-reading activity. The during reading activity, we're going to do this together. Well, actually... If you look at, and, we're, and I'm going to give it to you in a minute, Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau, Hobbes is the most difficult to read. In, in Locke, there aren't as many of these words, although you could do the same thing for Locke and for Rousseau. What are some of the limitations, would you say, of doing this? So this pre-reading activity where you have students, here's my thinking, and then you tell me what's wrong with it, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Oh, I'm, did that sound genuine? I meant for it to say, I, I really do want to see what may not work about this. Here's my thinking. I've seen the word. I may not have mastered the understanding of it, but when I come across it in the text, I have a foundation to work from. We use those other strategies when we're reading something, those other, the textual cues, we try to put it in context. We skip the word and come back to it to see if it makes more sense in, in, the, in the bigger picture. What are some of the limitations that you would see to doing this? I'm thinking of one, but I don't know if you guys have other ones. Time. Time. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. I yeah I agree. <laughs> Metacognitively, if they're not trying to really digest this information and ask key questions, deeper questions about the material, there's a good chance it's probably never going to make its way into a meaningful memory. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good point. Let's say we had an anticipatory set of some kind, or the, the day before, the end of the previous lesson, you collected an exit ticket and you had those sticky notes, and so you're going to group your students thoughtfully at the beginning of this lesson. I could easily, because this is a Word document, and I can copy and paste, cut and move around, I can easily manipulate this. I can manipulate the text. For those students who aren't quite ready, I'm going to take one paragraph. And we haven't done the during reading part yet either. But I, I'm going to take one paragraph, and I'm only going to have the words from that one paragraph. And I'm going to have students in this group just wrestle with that one paragraph. And so we can scaffold the thinking. We can break it all the way down. This is a lot. Those seven paragraphs there from beginning to end, OK, this, it's, it's a bunch to digest. So, how can we scale it back, focus on section by section, and go from there? That's what we're going to do now. This is a strategy that you may be familiar with also. It's called text graffiti. What I've done is I have taken a one-page passage from Hobbes, a one-page passage from Locke, and a one-page passage from Rousseau. The Hobbes, I've done the same thing. And I've put them on different colored pieces of paper, excerpts from that and then two other readings. I'm going to give everybody a piece of paper. Your piece of paper has a quote on it. I'm also going to give you this handout that says possible ways to graffiti a text. You're going to write on the piece of paper. Some of the ways that you can graffiti a text, you can write what you think it means. What information does a text give you about the author's perspective on nature, society, or government? What kind of perspective does a text give you? 
Is the text related to the theme of natural rights, social contract, or government, and how? I'm going to give everybody one of these. I spent all my time passing stuff out. That would be you're so nice. Can we pass these out? Okay. I'm going to give everybody a piece of the text. I'm going to give you three minutes to look at it. And then I'm going to say rotate, and we're going to pass our text to the next person. Another way that you can engage in text graffiti is you can respond to somebody else's comment. You could ask somebody a question based on what they wrote. And I don't tell my students this, by the way, but all of one author is on one color, all of another author is on another color, and all of the third author is on a third color. You're wondering who I'm giving you. It is pink. Yeah, you can write on it. Please do. So you're going to use the sheet that I gave you, answer any of those questions. You don't have to write a book, maybe just one comment, one question. And then in three minutes, we're going to pass them. Yeah. Well... Do you have an extra one? No. What do you all think? Would you, would you have them write the author down if they think they know it? Well, my, I, I'm sure my students would probably. Okay. Well, we're, we're all at an advanced level of readiness, so if, if you if you want to speculate. Oh, yeah, I mean, maybe the second semester or one semester course. <laughs> Were there any extra ways to graffiti a text? Mm -hmm. I was going to give you... I think I have it on the screen. You're supposed to do, um, you're supposed to read the text. This text right here, and, you're, and you can ask a question about it. You can, what information does the text give you about the author's perspective? So the idea of the graffiti is that you get to write on the text, and then we're going to pass it on. Somebody else is going to write something, or they might. Yeah. You can write a question, you can write a statement. But everybody should write something on that piece of paper. You can draw a picture, although that could be dangerous. You, you can make a personal connection to the text. What does it remind you of that you know about your life or in the world? What questions does it make you think about? Yeah, well, one minute, and then we're going to pass them. Or you can go ahead and pass them now if you're ready. Let's, let's go ahead and pass them around. I would probably have my students get up and walk around. And I've seen teachers who use this who play music. It's almost like musical chairs. They'll play music. Students walk around until the music stops. And then it's not a, a race, but they just sit down wherever they, they were when the music stops. So if you want to pass it to somebody else, now you're going to... Again, look at the sheet that says, how do you graffiti a text? You can respond to somebody else's comment. You can try to clarify. It's a different text, so maybe you have a different question or a different perspective.
Do you need just check it? Do we have, did we have one extra one over here? A second ago we did. Is there, is there another? Has somebody not traded yet? Anybody not traded? Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. We're going to stop in about a minute and a half. And I know you may not be done. On your table, I also put a handout that has all of these statements well, excuse me, not all these statements. It has some additional information about each one of the authors. I'm going to also pass out the primary document for each one of the authors so you can try to maybe guess which one you were looking at because it will be on here. I just copied and pasted. Are there some places you can have access to the file? Yeah. Yep. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, yep, I'm going to put all these on. These are the actual documents. Not the actual, but you know. Here's the original document that I cut and pasted. Okay, let's stop. Uh, now, how you do this. It's, it's about lunchtime, I think. So I'm, 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 yeah, I did. I followed my, followed my gut. Um, in, the, in the Prezi, so we have the pre-reading activity, we have the during reading activity, and then I use the, the one handout that has the table on it to have a deeper conversation about social contract theory with students. What does the state have? Why does the state have the right to rule? Why should citizens obey it? When should or shouldn't they obey it? I asked them about what are your thoughts regarding human nature. I, I'll have, I asked students, what do you think about being human is part of just being human? And what do you think about, well, that's not actually what I say. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's the nature versus nurture argument that you probably all have conversations with your student. In what ways are you who you are based on your social circumstances and your experiences? In what ways are you who you are based on your biology? And that's... Talk about a possible solution, which is a social contract, and then some additional issues. We have different views of human nature, different ideas about the relationship between the individual and the state. Hmm. Speaking of the matrix. <laughs> and what I'll, what I'll do, maybe, maybe right after lunch, when it's not right after lunch, but when it's my turn again before we go into the next part, is I also have an after reading strategy that involves uh, memes and music. So I give students photocopied pictures of Locke, Rousseau, and Hobbes, and they have to make a meme based on their understandings of Locke, Hobbes, and Rousseau. And I also have songs that... I'll share with you that the lyrics talk about human nature and so on and so forth, and we'll go from there. So I think it's lunchtime.